All right, before we get going here, if you're not already a subscriber, click the button and ring the bell so you don't miss anything. Thanks. Everybody, like I just said about the uh, call to action, subscribe before we get going here. Let me also remind you of an event we have coming up, one of our signature live events. Mucha Palooza here in Annapolis, July 15th, featuring my new band, Danger Boy, doing a uh, one-set showcase. We did this last year. It was a blast. And uh, we decided to do it again this year. Tickets are available. The link is in the episode description. So check it out. So thanks for joining me on a Monday at noon, wherever you are in the world. If you're on the East Coast, maybe you're taking a break from work and having lunch. So yesterday I posted an episode that I called Ungrounded, which was a document, a mini document, a mini documentary about my trip up to Hartford, Connecticut on May 11th which was a function of this episode, which was just a short sort of current events episode about the fact that the army chief of staff had grounded the entire army's aviation arm, both fixed and rotary wing in the wake of basically three mishaps. Two of them happened pretty close to each other, a Black Hawk midair and an Apache midair. And so after that episode, or in that episode, I was talking about how the chief of staff's direction was active duty units had to do their safety stand down within that first week in May, and guard and reserve units had to do it by the end of May. So I was contacted by Warrant Officer 4 Kurt Suter at the Connecticut Air National Guard. And he asked if I would be willing to give them a brief as part of their mandated safety stand down. And I was, of course, flattered and very much interested in, in doing this kind of a brief. And when I asked him what the date was, he said May 11th. And that date was kind of bad for me because I had been up in New York uh, a few days prior, actually the day prior, uh, at the Westminster Dog Show. We had a dog in the dog show, which is... Uh, kind of a big deal. And uh, so the logistics, we were just be coming back. I had some episodes in work that I needed to get live and so forth and so on. And so I basically told Kurt, it'd be hard to get back up there. And he said, well, we will fly you. And so I actually got orders, uh, bottom line by a two star. Originally, we were going to fly out of BWI. It wound up, as you saw in that episode that I flew out of Andrews, there was some confusion about one leg, two leg. I flew the first leg with a distinguished visitor, a DV, um, the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Manpower, uh, a guy named Alex Wagner. And uh, so anyway, I got up there, did the brief. And as you guys saw in the episode, part of... Uh, the, the brief was what I, I called highlights of uh, my remarks. And it wasn't the whole brief. And that was because uh, basically, let's just call it, there was a technical issue with the, the PAO uh, who was shooting it for the Connecticut National Guard. And, and the whole brief was not uh, captured. So many of you, in the comments of the episode that I posted yesterday said, I would love to see the whole brief. And so I was thinking, okay, well, it wasn't that I cut it out of the episode. It, it doesn't, it wasn't captured. So I thought, why don't I just give the brief? And I thought it would be sort of cool to do it as a live stream. So here we are. So um, I will address, let's call it questions at the end. Um, and I won't have time to look at the comments now, so you guys can talk to each other as you normally do when I'm doing these live streams. And then when I'm done with the brief, we'll, we'll try to address some of the comments you might have or some of the remarks you might have. 
Now, let me start by by talking about some of the givens when you're talking aviation safety. First is aviation safety, military aviation safety does not call things accidents. We call them mishaps, and that's a non-trivial distinction. Accidents sort of indicate something happened that was outside of anybody's control, happenstance, act of God, whatever. And that doesn't work for preventing military mishaps. If you look at any mishap report, somewhere in the chain of events, it could have been stopped and prevented. And so that's kind of the context and the construct that we use when we're talking about aviation mishaps. The second given, the second premise, is that nothing that I'm going to say here is to judge the actions in a negative characterization. As we say in aviation safety, it is white hat. So everything we're going to talk about today is with the idea that to talk about it will prevent these mishaps from occurring in the future. So that's the way I went about uh, presenting this to uh, the Connecticut Air National Guard. The other thing, I will talk about some rotary wing mishaps, particularly V-22 uh, mishaps, uh, but mostly because of my experience, I'll be talking about fixed wing mishaps, particularly Tomcat and in one case, an A-4 mishap that I was involved in. So the lessons are not specific to the airplane that I'll talk about. And that's the other point here. And it's also not specific to military aviation. aviation. So if, if you are uh, involved in civil aviation, if you're an airline pilot, these lessons apply to you as well. Or if you are involved in anything, sometimes these lessons could apply to driving your family vehicle uh, down the interstate. So, Yes, in fact, I'm going to be talking about some specific types of airplanes, but I'd like you to think about the lessons in, in, more, in broader terms. Now, my bona fides, as it were, for talking about aviation safety are basically threefold. I was the safety officer in two fighter squadrons, VF-143, the puking dogs, and VF-102, the Diamondbacks. But what gave me a broader understanding of particularly naval aviation safety was the tour I did at the Naval Safety Center in Norfolk. So I was the editor of Approach Magazine, which is the Naval Safety Center's aviation safety, what they call review. And I have a bound copy of, of some of the issues that I did when I was there. And I actually got this job in a very unorthodox way. And I've talked about this on the channel before, but I did a cartoon. Let me see if I can put it up here closer called Brown Shoes in Action Comics. That started out as a thing I was doing for the flight schedule in, in VF 32. And the guy who was the editor of Approach Magazine ahead of me did a lot to improve Approach. And the commander of the Naval Safety Center said to this guy, his name's Dave Parsons, who I've had on the channel before uh, as well, call sign Hey Joe. He said, Hey Joe, I've, I love what you've done with Approach Magazine. More people are reading it. Safety rates are where we want them to be and trending in the right way. I need you to handpick somebody to come relieve me. And so Dave said, there's only one guy that I can think of, and that's Ward Carroll Mooch. And he's already on shore duty because I was... I'd left VF-32 and I was on uh, shore duty at VT-86 as a Rio instructor down in Pensacola. And uh, Admiral Bad Fred Lewis, who was a Tomcat legend, a great man, great leader, said to Hey Joe, okay, let's get him. And so long story short, they got what was called an NMPC, which is the Navy, Navy Military Personnel Command waiver. So I could go from shore duty to shore duty. And I'd only been at VT-86 for a year. So it wasn't like I was, uh, you know, getting out of any sea tours. Um, so wound up going to the Naval Safety Center where I was the editor of Approach Magazine. And, and during the 22 months I was there, I saw how the mishap investigators do business. 
I saw how the class desk officers review mishap investigation reports, and I fielded all of the stories that are in Approach Magazine, which are submitted by members of the fleet. And this is kind of unique to naval aviation in that, again, White Hat, people are willing to talk about their transgressions under the auspices of you won't be judged. It's in the spirit of making sure it doesn't happen again. So those are kind of the, uh, the things I bring to the table when talking about aviation safety. Plus, any naval aviator, any military aviator has got to have a safety sort of outlook baked into them. It's from the first day of flight school. Um, you, you have to memorize boldface. You review procedures. You're always cognizant of, of how dangerous, how inherently dangerous this profession is. So let me bring up the brief and uh, we'll just go through the slides. Again, I will endeavor to answer questions at the end. So I've divided the brief into four different categories of aviation mishaps. The first one I call aeromechanical misunderstandings. So you guys have probably seen this episode. It was my first really popular one. It's at 3 million views now. The real truth about Kara Holt Green's F-14 Tomcat mishap. And I know people like to, you know, grammarians like to say, there's no such thing as the real truth. I, I got it. Um, it's just sort of part of my brand, the real truth. So as you might remember in that episode, it deals with Kara Holt Green, who is one of the first female naval aviators involved in aviation, carrier aviation, basically. And there, this time was strange in that um, in some ways politics got in the way and uh, folks were force fed as it were into carrier aviation in a, let's just say, not organic way. Um, that's not a political statement. That's just fact. As I say in that episode, the airplane doesn't know your sexual orientation, your gender, or your race. So as also documented, the Tomcat, especially F-14A, circa early 90s, before digital flight control system and all the other improvements that it got towards the end of its life, was a tough airplane to both dogfight and specifically to land on the carrier. So let me play the, uh, the mishap here. So basically what happened there, and let me go to training aids and I got my training aids graphic for you guys. Hold on. <laughs> go to the training aids. So we got Gypsy 214 here. So the F-14, like every airplane, and I'll say this a bunch of times during this live stream, the F-14 is subject to the laws of physics. As you can see, it has a gigantic fuselage. 25% of the Tomcat's lift comes from the fuselage, what we used to call the tennis court. So let's talk about how this airplane performs in two regimes. First, let's talk about dogfighting. So high angle of attack, low airspeed, what we call region four. Well, the other thing we need to mention up front, as you guys, any F-14 fans know, and this is an F-14A, you can tell by the black exhaust nozzles instead of the silver that are the GE F-110 on the B and the D model, this is an A with the Pratt & Whitney TF-30. Um, prone to compressor stalls. So... If I'm fighting the airplane, high angle of attack, 
say I've got another guy and I'm trying to do a flat scissors and get behind him. So I'm nursing this airplane. Angle of attack is pegged all the way above 30 units. And I decide I'm going to make a magic move. So maybe I boot right rudder to pirouette the airplane, which will actually cause the airplane to roll as I did in the Top Gun final dogfight scene episode demonstrated that using DCS. But in any case, if I impart this yaw and at the same time I lose this engine due to a compressor stall, the airplane will enter a flat spin very quickly. Okay, so let's look at the flat, uh, the sing, uh, I'm sorry, flat spin bold face. So I apologize, this is little, but let me go through it. So if, if I'm, let me get over here. If I'm in a flat spin, right? I know because it's flat attitude, lack of pitch and roll rate, increasing yaw rate. First thing I do, stick forward, neutral lateral, lock your harness. And the reason you lock your harness is because the eyeball out G, when you're at the end of this inertial vector, especially the pilot, is extreme. In fact, if the pilot doesn't lock his harness right away, he's going to be hunched over the stick, face into the instrument panel in a way that you cannot push back, lock your harness. So he's basically incapacitated. And pilots who have been in flat spins and their Rios said I, all he could do was kind of emit a gag. He couldn't even talk on the ICS, right? So that's why that step is right in there. Harness lock. Throttles both to idle. You want to match the thrust. So if, you've had, if you have asymmetric thrust because you've compressor stalled one engine, you want to match the thrust to try to maybe reduce that asymmetric movement. Rudder, opposite turn needle, yaw, spin arrow. So as the yaw rate would get up to higher than, and I'm blanking on the exact number, X number of degrees per second, a spin arrow would show up on both the pilot's VDI and the Rio's TID, or P P TID in the later years, which would point to what direction the airplane was spinning to hopefully make it easier to figure out how to counter that. So rudder, opposite turn needle, law, yaw. If no recovery, stick into the turn needle. If your rate is steady increasing, spin arrow flashing, or eyeball out G, roll SAS on, stick into and aft. If the recovery is indicated, neutralize, recover at 17 units. This is the important part. If the flat spin is verified by flat attitude, increasing yaw rate, Increasing eyeball out gene, lack of pitch and roll rate, canopy jettison, what Bruce didn't do, and Rio command eject. Notice it doesn't say whoever command eject. The, the assumption here is the pilot, as I said, is incapacitated at this point. So the Rio will command eject. All right. So you remember this episode we did with Nasty out at Tailhook this past year. And also the one we did with Sam Richardson Slammer the year before, who was in Nasty's back seat. Nasty admits that he did not comply to the letter with the bold face that we just went over. In fact, he was doing a technique that he heard anecdotally in the ready room that was not really part of. In fact, he had pro spin controls in. And so instead of the airplane recovering, he basically held it into a spin until Slammer uh, initiated ejection. So aeromechanic misunderstanding. So let's talk about the landing pattern now. So in the landing pattern, the airplane also, and as you're landing, as I've talked about in some of the DCS technique, Mooch's DCS hacks episode with the Tomcat, 15 units angle of attack is your target AOA in the pattern. All right, so Carol Holt Green, day, day fleet CQ, comes into the break at Lincoln. She's in VF213. So the technique is down the base recovery course, about a mile upwind, break, 280 knots, wings, going to auto, 250 gear, 
200 knots flaps, and it's trim, speed brakes, fuel. You got to figure out what your own speed is. And DLC, direct lift control, those little, your, in, your spoilers will float so you can correct um, your glide slope without moving the nose around. All right, so she gets to the, she gets to the 180, gets to the 90, she's looking okay, gets to the 45, and she realizes, and this was her tendency, that she's going to overshoot. And so wraps it up. And again, let me show you the plaid tape here. And what you can't hear is the LSOs at some point are screaming eject. So all right, so single engine bold face is as follows. Okay, again, admittedly, this happened at the worst possible time. At the 45. Slow speed, she's probably at about 138 knots, maybe 135 knots, depending on the fuel weight of the airplane. Gets the stall indication on the left engine. This is what she should have done. Set 10 degree pitch attitude on the water line. 14 units, angle of attack maximum. Rudder, not stick, rudder opposite roll yaw, supplemented by stick. Both throttles is required for a positive rate of climb. Gear up, which reduces drag and jettison if required. So what Lieutenant Hulkring did, and this is a natural tendency. Again, we're, we're white hat here. Okay, natural tendency. If I'm at the 45, lose this engine, airplane starts to do this. My first tendency is counter left roll with right stick, right? But unfortunately, in the F-14... The aero mechanics of the F-14, if you do that, right stick is actually going to create this proverse roll, adverse yaw, and exacerbate the problem. So what, in accordance with the bold face and the dozens of simulators that all Tomcat pilots did in those days, first move is right rudder. And so what that should do is get the airplane rolling, and then you get the nose under control. Okay. So first get the rudder, then get the nose 10 degrees on the horizon, 14 units angle of attack. Throttles as required. The other problem there, and again, you can't hear this, is the LSOs are screaming eject. I'm sorry. The LSOs are screaming besides eject. They're also, at this point, the LSO screams burner right here, when she's flat, right about there, the LSO's saying burner, which is a bad call. So if she just blindly follows it with one engine stalled, she's going to exacerbate the asymmetric thrust. So because they scream eject about there, and you can see the Rio comes out, and then she never gets out of the airplane. Um, the Rio winds up surviving. Uh, Kara, unfortunately, did not. As I've mentioned in many episodes, the ejection sequence in the Tomcat, if I pull the handle, canopy comes off. You don't eject through the canopy. Canopy comes off. 0.5 seconds later, the rear seat goes. 0.4 seconds after that, the front seat goes. And these seats go different ways. The Rio goes off to... The left, the pilot goes off to the right. Boom. That's the way the rockets are designed. It's for, you know, make sure you don't hit each other as well as the canopy, et cetera. It's a great system, very reliable. But basically from handle pull till pilot comes out is almost a second. And in this case, that was a lifetime. So that is... Example number one of an aero mechanic. Well, I guess that's example number two because we were talking about Nasty's flat spin. But that's a classic Tomcat aero mechanic misunderstanding, right? All our plans subject to the laws of physics. Now, my first job out of the Navy, and uh, as some of you might know, I retired after 20 
I was teaching at the Naval Academy, um, having done nothing basically but fly Tomcats up to that point, and uh, got a job down at the Naval Air Systems Command on the V-22 program. And this is 2002. So the V-22 had been shut down. That program had been shut down for two years at that point and was almost killed altogether. Uh, Dick Cheney was the Secretary of Defense, and he was like, I, this airplane's dangerous. It's a waste of money. I don't believe in the technology. And because there were so many constituents who needed this airplane, basically there was Marine Corps. There was AFSOC, Air Force Special Operations Command, with the CB-22. And then eventually, as we've seen now, the Navy was going to use it as a replacement for the COT. Now, the Marines particularly had no replacement for the H-46. There was nothing in the procurement pipeline. This was it. And so let's just say they were leveraged, if not over leveraged, against the success of this airplane. But if you do not do procurement right, you're going to goon it up. And we've seen this time and time again. So in this case, what we say here is operational test got ahead of developmental test. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. So I worked at V-22 from 2002 to 2005 and got to see that airplane kind of figure it out and the program fix itself. A lot of support, a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of talent, kind of like what JSF is doing now. In fact, a lot of the folks who worked V-22 when I was there, were transferred to F-35 after the V-22 uh, got its milestone three full rate production decision. So um, in any case, there were a series of mishaps that got this airplane almost shut down altogether and basically sidelined, grounded for two years. What we're seeing here is the crash site in Marana, Arizona. Again, this is a classic example of an aeromechanic misunderstanding. All right. And as I said, develop, oh, or operational test got ahead of developmental test. So basically the way it works, developmental test figures out all of the limits of the airplane. Developmental test in this case was at Patuxent River, NAS Patuxent River down in Southern Maryland. Operational test was going on at Marine Corps Air Station New River, just south of Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. So what happened is the operational test team was getting very comfortable with the airplane. And they weren't waiting for a developmental test to prove out certain flight regimes. They were just sort of figuring it out on their own. And one of the flight regimes that they thought the, the placarded envelope was too restrictive was rate of descent. So placarded meaning the limit of the rate of descent in the V-22 was 800 feet per minute. And what operational test, which is VMMT 20, is it 204, 203, 204? Um, the squadron down at New River they're flying it and they're going more than 800 feet. And they're like, this is really just fine. In fact, I'm doing 1500 feet per minute. I'm doing 2000 feet per minute. And this is how you're going to do a rapid insert when you've got 15 to 20 Marines in the back, you know, this is how you get them in and get them out. And so they were loving the idea that they could go beyond what they were being told that this airplane could do. But that, 800 feet per minute didn't just get invented out of nowhere. That was the proven limit to keep the V-22 out of what we call vortex ring state, which is basically deep stall. All right, let me show you the airplane again. So you can see the, the generational improvement, the innovation of the V-22, the tilt rotor technology, is the fact that the prop rotors can tilt. The nacelles, the things that hold the engine, can go from vertical, the helicopter mode, all the way forward to airplane mode. So this is how this assault support aircraft can hover 
but then go 275 knots, which is more than twice as fast as the airplane that it uh, replaced, right? The H-46. Again, this was the Marines particularly, and SOCOM, not SOCOM, AFSOC, um, was loving the idea that you can get folks in and out of an objective really quick. And so that should improve survivability. But what this airplane is also subject to the laws of physics. So the thing that allows it to rotate, the nacelles to rotate, the size of those prop rotors um, also puts a lot of force on each one of them. And if you look at, for instance, an H-53, these gigantic or one of those Russian helicopters that are really huge, you can see how long those rotor blades are. This has very smallish, rigid prop rotors. So what, and as I mentioned in, in yesterday's episode during the lecture, we used to get asked, can this airplane auto-rotate? And the answer was yes. In the strictest sense, the V-22 can auto-rotate. However, you're coming downhill at about 15 to 20,000 feet per minute when you do that. So technically that's auto-rotating, but they're the nature of auto rotation, why you want to do it in a helicopter is in the end game, you increase the rotor pitch and arrest the rate of descent. So if you're a helicopter pilot, if you've flown an H-57 or a Kiowa or a Huey, that airplane is, it's, it, you can save the airplane in the end game by doing an auto rotation and arresting the rate of descent. In the V-22, you cannot. There's no way to stop that rate of descent. So yes, technically it can auto-rotate at altitude, but not to the point that you can save the airplane. So what happened is the OT guys were out west in the Yuma area working with the Marine Air Weapons Training School, MOTS, kind of Marine Corps Top Gun. And they were eager to show these helicopter guys, how impressive the V-22 was in, in a tactical scenario. So again, OT is ahead of DT. This is before Opaval. This airplane has not been approved for full rate production at this time. And this is a uh, 99-2000 timeframe. So nighttime op, two V-22s get to the, the sort of initial point and start coming downhill. Again, they're, they're like, we're going to show them just how awesome this airplane is. They are coming downhill at 2,000 feet per minute, almost three times the placarded limit of 800 feet per minute. Neither of them realize they're in deep vortex ring state. Lead airplane suddenly has asymmetric thrust or asymmetric lift is what I should say, because the prop rotors are turning at the same RPM, but the airplane rolls no, and then goes nose down and hits the desert. The pilot behind the lead doesn't see the roll, but does see the explosion. So that pilot programs the nacelles forward enough to arrest the rate of descent and lands kind of on the belly. Airplane is basically destroyed, but no one on that airplane dies. So a great save by that trail pilot who continued flying the V-22 for, for, in fact, was a squadron CO uh, in, in the years that followed. So again, that is an example of aeromechanic misunderstanding, getting too comfortable with an airplane and wantonly disregarding the limits of the airplane. Another V-20, so, so that mishap by itself didn't get the program shut down. Some months later, an airplane down at Marine Corps Station New River was doing practice approaches at night. Just a single airplane with pilot, co-pilot, and two guys in the back. On final, the pilot got a master caution light. So this airplane has health monitoring. It has digital, a lot of cool stuff. You know, it, it's a, a modern airplane. And so this light was just bugging the pilot and, and he just wanted to, to not have a light on. So 
he pushed it to put it out and it went out and then it came on again. And so he pushed it again. He just kept pushing that master caution light over and over again to extinguish it, not realizing that every time he pushed the light, the prop rotor pitch went to zero. And so he was losing massive altitude with each depression of that master caution light until he flew into the swamp about four miles short of the runway at Marine Corps Air Station New River. Had he done nothing and just got on deck with the light on, they would have been fine. So systems understanding, you've got to know the cause and effect of every part of your airplane. So that, that was another aeromechanic misunderstanding example. All right, the second category is what we call failing military aviator. So in some cases, it's pretty obvious when you have a failing military aviator, just like when you have a failing coworker. Sometimes life stressors reveal themselves in very overt and deliberate ways. And that's, that's an easy thing for the chain of command to solve. Right? If you have somebody who has an you know, addiction problem or shows up with bourbon on his breath or is affected by marital strife or whatever, you ground them. You take them off the flight schedule. And you attend to it until that person is, is good to go. I've seen it happen a number of times. And generally, the aviator who's been grounded accepts it in the spirit that it's intended. Nobody's happy about it. But usually I, what I've seen in my career is the, the guy's like, okay, yeah, you're right. I need to focus on my home life or I need to get into AA or whatever it is. But sometimes it's more insidious. It, it has some subtleties about it. So that's the case in the Stacey Bates mishap in, in Nashville in 1994. And I did this episode some months ago. If you haven't seen it, um, recommend you, you check it out. So Stacey Bates was an all-star naval officer, Naval Academy grad. When he got commissioned, he chose Naval Flight Officer as his warfare specialty. Uh, and he got Tomcats out of VT-86, went to Miramar, was in VF-114, the Aardvarks, as a Rio. All-star, conscientious, hardworking. The chain of command loved him. He solved problems proactively, did his ground job, took care of the troops. The number one lieutenant in the Red Room. So at this time, a few communities had this, what we call a retread program. The retread program was where NFOs could go back to flight school as pilots and then come back as pilots in their respective communities. So this was done in the Tomcat community. It was done in the A6 community, in the Prowler community, and also the S3 community. And this was the driver behind this was basically the fact that we were losing pilots because the airlines were hiring big time in the early 90s. So this exodus of pilots who didn't want to go to sea anymore and, uh, you know, wanted more home life, although being an airline pilot doesn't really get you that much home life, it turns out, as they found out the hard way. But in any case, we needed pilots. And it seemed like this was a expeditious, low-risk way to do it. So Stacy puts his name in the in the hat for the retread program, and he gets it because his record is, is outstanding. So he goes to flight school as a pilot, goes back to Pensacola. And so in flight school, it turns out he has some tendencies that aren't awesome. He's behind the airplane sometimes. Um, he has a, a couple of downs, uh, but he's, he, he, let's just say, squeaks by and winds up getting his wings. Now, because of one of the mandates of the retread program was you would go back to the airplane you came from. Again, you're trying to leverage your fleet savvy. And they thought that was something that would expedite the learning curve. Because generally in flight school, now there's a quality spread and other things, but generally, you know, the, the top aviators in primary get jets and the 
folks who aren't in the top wind up getting helicopters. That's not a slam on helicopters, just the way it is. Um, and the Tomcat was was known as a hard airplane to fly. So, and this wasn't universally true. Every time I say this, some A7 drivers like, that's BS, Mooch. Okay, got it. But let's just say that Tomcat pilots organically were in the top, if not the top, of their flight school classes. So Stacy was not, but because he's a former Tomcat Rio, he winds up getting back to the Tomcat community. So he gets through the rag and is sent to VF-213. Now, during this era, VF-213 is having some, some issues. This is the same squadron that Kara Holtgreen uh, was in. They had a mishap over the USS John Paul Jones where the airplane was doing a supersonic pass and it came apart. The crew managed to eject. Stacy Bates got into a flat spin, a la what we were talking about before. Dogfighting, Region 4, high angle of attack, low airspeed, got the airplane into a flat spin, punched out. In the FENAB, it was, fine, it was found that ultimately he wasn't at fault. The FENAB, Field Naval Aviators Evaluation Board, so he was given a thumbs up, keep your wings, stay in the squadron, keep flying. Now, meanwhile, in the months that follow that mishap, he's demonstrating some trends. These are sort of insidious, sort of subtle, kind of the thing that it doesn't jump out at you. In one case, he forgot to lower the flaps on downwind to the point that the Rio actually had to like yell at him to get his attention as he was doing the landing checklist, as the airplane was starting to do a little bit of wing rock. In another case, case three at night at the Lincoln, he allowed the airspeed to decay to the degree that the Rio thought they were also going to depart and had to very stridently tell him to come on with the power. So other Rios saw some headwork trends, other trends that, in general, he was behind the airplane. And it got so bad that a number of the junior officer Rios in the squadron went to the maintenance officer and the operations officer, two department heads, lieutenant commanders, one of whom I know very well, and said, we're not going to fly with Stacey Bates anymore. We refuse to fly with him. Now, as a guy who prided myself on flying with the hard cases, I, I would never have gone to anyone and go, I'm not going to fly with this guy. So that's either a weak pool of Rios or a bad pilot, an exceptionally bad pilot. So I'll let you be the judge, which it was. In any case, those department heads went to the CO and the XO. CO was a pilot, XO was a Rio, and said, hey, these JOs just came to us and said they're not going to fly with, with Stacey Bates anymore. And the CEO particularly was invested in his success because he had ruled in the flat spin mishap investigation, the subsequent FENAB, that he was good to go. And so he just said, then don't schedule those Rios with him. Fly them with other guys. And that was kind of it. So some weeks go by. Stacy decides he wants to go to visit his parents who lived in Chattanooga, which is fairly close to Nashville. And he gets one of the first tour Rios to go on this weekend excursion with him. And we used to do this all the time, right? It's good, good flight hours. You do airways, nav, do a low level on the way. And, and it's great experience. And then maybe you can have some fun in between, visit your family, friends, uh, someplace you've always wanted to go. This is one of the perks of being in naval aviation or military aviation for that matter. So he goes uh, to Nashville. They spend the weekend there. This picture is Stacy with his parents the day of this mishap. So man up the airplane. He tells his parents, I'm going to do a cool departure for you. So they knew that there was this restaurant at, at the runway they gave you a great view. Um, and so they positioned themselves there. Stacy briefed the Rio, hey, we're going to do a uh, unlimited climb. So let's request an unlimited climb. 
but the weather didn't support an unlimited climb. There was a solid overcast at 3,000 feet. So probably shouldn't have done attempted an unlimited climb. Further, because the weather report said there were layers, they figured if they pull nose up, full afterburner, they would break through the clouds and wind up on top, and they would be fine. So as for the unlimited climb, they get it. F-14A, zone two, start to roll. Zone five, gear up, flaps up, gets to about 300 knots, stick in his lap, aggressively nose high, 35, 40 degrees nose high, disappears. Unfortunately, the airplane never breaks out. Meanwhile, Stacy has vertigo, and he perceives that he's in a climb, so he pushes the stick all the way forward, still perceiving his inner ear has screwed him up, that he's in a climb. So he's now 80 degrees nose low. He's not referencing his gauges. And as all aviators know, when you're flying IFR, your instructor will tell you, trust your instruments. So they break out of the clouds, 80 degrees nose low at 3,000 feet. He realizes they're in extremis. The airplane kind of went off to the southwest of the field at Nashville. They took off to the west. They're now three miles southwest. Stacy realizes this is not good. He pulls the stick all the way into his lap going about 500 knots. And the airplane does a massive, I'm sure they pulled about 10 plus Gs. There's some idea that the Rio was knocked out as a function of that pull. Again, mishap investigators have ways of, through toxology and different things, knowing what your physical state was at impact. They hit a house three miles from the airport. Airplane destroyed, killed some residents in that house, as well as both of the air crew. This is a photo taken from the crash site. So in the wake of this, a bunch of other things emerged. And this happens way too often. And this is the safety lesson learned. If you see something, say something. That he was having some other life stressors and some other challenges that were overwhelming him. Also, this was very uncharacteristic that he would try this, um, let's just call it a shit hot departure. He's usually more sort of straight and narrow and realizing the weather was marginal. He didn't have, you know, Cavu weather um, that he probably shouldn't have done that, obviously. This was a very high visibility mishap because of the loss of civilian life. And so if you watch the episode um, that I did on this mishap, um, a lot of the, my research information, the reference information is the CNO, who was a Tomcat pilot, Jay Johnson the chief of naval operations and his action officer was the late great captain snort snodgrass who died in an aircraft a civilian aircraft mishap a couple of summers ago um and uh so i entreat you to watch that episode because it goes in great detail about what emerged as we say natops which is the basically owner's manual for each airplane is written in blood and we also say there are no new mishaps, just old people or new people doing the same old mishaps. So imminently preventable and a tragedy truly understates it. So this is a failing naval aviator. And again, what makes it more dangerous is it was more subtle than somebody who's really unhinged or coming apart. But you got to take care of each other in the squadron and recognize things the chain of command has got to do the right thing at every at every turn. Right. The third category of mishap is what we're calling fifth month of deployment. This could also be called complacency. So. As I've talked about. On. Another episode, I, I had the opportunity to fly with the Blue Angels. 
what impressed me about the Blue Angels beyond the the amazing stuff I got to do, and this is me in the back of Blue Angel number four, khaki flight suit and the uh, the helmet there. Um, this is the image I've used for my welcome to my channel episode. As you guys probably know, you can see the other airplanes in my visor. Kind of like that image. But what was very cool about the Blue Angels, besides the 45 minute routine itself, and I, I flew in 2012, so they were flying the Legacy Hornet at this time, not the Super Hornets, was the brief and the debrief. So you figure these guys at that point, and I flew with them in September of 2012, so you think winter training starts in January, they fly two, three times a day during winter practice, and then they do the routine Friday, Saturday, Sunday from March on. So they've flown this thing hundreds of times. They briefed it infinitum as if they had never flown it. Further, they debriefed it in a way that was, they had, their video support is, is impressive. So everything's videotaped. They all have coaches clickers. So they're looking at roll rates and going, okay, look, at I, I, I rolled too fast here. And, and it's just incredible attention to detail. The debrief takes as long as the brief. And as we were, as I was sitting there watching this, I'm just thinking, you know, I remember when we would do these contingency ops, like Operation Southern Watch particularly, that we do this day after day, four months, the same thing. We're gonna launch, we'll rendezvous, we'll hit the tanker, we'll go over country, we'll check in with the AWACS, we'll basically drill holes in the sky because there was nothing going on in Southern Iraq at that time. Maybe every once in a while you get a little bit of a tickle from a SAM, but as soon as they realized you saw them, they'd shut down. Or you'd hear there's a MiG-25 airborne or whatever, but mostly it was just flying holes in the sky, waiting to tank again. So because we had tanked a number of times and mostly on KC-135. So the thing about the KC-135 that's, that's challenging, if you look at that probe, right where those little winglets are, about halfway down, then past that is a flexible hose with a Navy style basket. So you guys, and I don't want to insult your intelligence, but as you know, Air Force tanking with Air Force airplanes, the tanker is the male, the receiver is the female. Navy does it 180 out. Basically, the receiving airplane is the male and the tanker is the female. So you have to modify, in this case, the KC-135 with this uh, you know, little adapter there. And that didn't have a take-up reel like a normal apparatus. And so you'd plug it and then you'd put a little loop in it and you'd have to be very conscientious about not deviating too far. So it was pretty sporty is the bottom line. And so uh, we would do this multiple times during an Operation Southern Watch flight. And so by the time you are on the fifth month of cruise, you're probably pretty comfortable with getting on and off the tanker, right? I mean, if, you're, if you would ask somebody, what's going to be the challenging part of an Operation Southern Watch mission? You'd be like, well, getting shot by a SAM or tangling with a Iraqi MiG. But as it turns out, the challenging part was getting on and off the tanker safely. So at, because we were supporting a lot of airplanes coming in and out of country, and this was the height of Operation Southern Watch, basically patrolling the no-fly zone south of the 33rd parallel. So the Hornet was a gas-poor airplane. Um, and so they would have to hit the tanker, you know, more than we did. And sometimes you'd arrive at your tanker and there would be upwards of 10 airplanes waiting to tank on the wing. 
And this tanker would do this 10 mile racetrack, left hand turns. And you'd basically play crack the whip. So you can imagine how intense that is. And then now do it at night. So, but because you would do it all the time, you got kind of comfortable with the, 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 that part of the, that evolution. So one night, one of our Hornet squadrons, the Marine Corps squadron, the OPSO was flying on the wing of the EXO. And at some point, he, his, his attention deviated. Perhaps he stopped flying for him for a second and, and looked at a, you know, a gauge or, or whatever. But at that moment, his flight lead, the squadron XO, did a move to correct the fact that they were closing on the tanker in his perception too fast. The wingman missed that move and wound up flying his airplane through the cockpit of the flight lead, which killed the XO instantly. That's the only mishap we had on that deployment. Again, complacency. You get comfortable, that's a, a kind of a signal that you should never be comfortable. So did they brief the specifics about the tanker pattern infinitum? The debrief suggested that they, they sort of glossed over that part, as we all were at that point. We're kind of like, okay, Remember that thing we did yesterday? We're going to do it again today. Now, let's talk about the specifics of this mission, meaning what's different about today that, than, than yesterday. We didn't talk about, okay, align the fuselages, slow, steady closure, want to fly port observation down his wing line, wait for him and slide back, probes coming out, fly the knuckle, watch the hose, don't, don't extend it and snap off the probe tip. We, we stopped having those conversations in that level of detail after about the first month of cruise. All right, another recent example of, let's call it fifth month of deployment, is this F-35 ramp strike. So you guys who follow my channel for some months now, remember that when this first happened, me, Hoser, and Rowdy did a analysis of sort of the big picture without getting ahead of the mishap board. And then we waited for about a year and a half for the public releasable part of the mishap report to come out, which it turns out what we kind of surmised was the issue beforehand that the pilot got complacent. So first tour lieutenant, fifth month of cruise kind of thing. Although I think in this case, it was the sixth month of cruise because this was a seven month cruise. Vincent, last line period. They had just finished a very intense deployment, a lot of stuff toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Chinese, and now they're headed home. And so you feel this sense of accomplishment, joy, maybe the pack comes off a little bit. And this was, the situation was further um, made potentially bad with these air wing LSOs said, basically, Okay, is for any of my wingmates who come into the break with what we're calling a expeditious recovery maneuver, what we used to call a shit hot break. So basically, this is come in at 450, 500 knots, break at the bow and get aboard. All right, instead of what normally you would do, you come to the break at 350 knots, break a mile or a mile and a half upwind, so forth, give yourself more time on downwind get yourself squared away all right so this lieutenant from vfa 147 comes into the break at 450 knots plus 800 feet breaks at the stern so he's going to have trouble right from the get-go of getting that airplane slowed down so let me play you the plat tape and uh, I'll comment on the backside. So here's the plat. Okay, so 
that's from two different views. Um, what happened, because he was so fast, the power was basically at idle for the entire pass. Now, as we discussed in all of our episodes, live streams and otherwise, where we discuss this, this mishap, the F-35 has what's called PLM, precision landing mode. So basically the pilot connects to, let's just for the facile sense of, of simplistic engineering, this tractor beam that all the pilot is responsible for is managing the, where the velocity vector goes. Okay, so the velocity vector is just put on the three wire. So he maybe doesn't even know what his fuel weight is. He doesn't know what his airspeed is because the airplane's taking care of all that. So I described the Tomcat coming to the break when we were talking about the Kara Holtgreen mishap, right? Wings, gear, flaps, DLC, trim, fuel, lock your harness, hook. All the F-35 has to do is drop the gear, drop the hook and engage PLM and point the velocity vector, the flight path marker, where you want to land. It's amazing. And it's a lot safer. So you talk to a current F-35 pilot, you want to talk ball flank technique, you know, meatball lineup, angle attack, that's a foreign language to them, right? So old guys like me are like, so what if it doesn't work? And the response is, and you saw this in the comments of the live stream we did, there were guys who were Super Hornet guys and, and current aviators who were like, hey, Gramps, it never doesn't work. And so in the wake of this mishap, I actually asked the former program manager of the Joint Strike Fighter, okay, Admiral, you told me this couldn't happen. What happened? And he's like, I, A, don't know because the mishap report is not yet, but if you do not engage PLM because you're out of limits, then... It's not this tractor beam, this magic carpet that we've designed. And that's what happened here. Now, the problem is the pilot didn't realize that he was not engaged with PLM. And so when he saw the, the ball sag or he realized that he couldn't maintain his flight path marker where he wanted to land, now it's starting to go short of that, his move, because he assumed that the computer would do everything that needed to be done wasn't to advance the throttle to arrest this rate of descent. It was to just program side stick aft. And that actually made the descent worse because there's no power coming on. So that by, by the time he's hearing those power calls, it's too late. And let me play this again here. So this is the side view. And right there, you can see the pilot ejects. He broke his back. One of the LSOs was hurt very badly, had to be flown to the Philippines. And a tractor driver outside the starboard ladder line by the landing area uh, was also badly hurt. Okay. Complacency, fifth month of cruise, we get comfortable. The... CAG LSO probably shouldn't have put out, hey, come on in for this is expedited, expedited recovery maneuver, should hot break. Um, and those who participated in that should have realized that when you get to the 45 and you're still way too fast, like we say, John Wayne in the break, Slim Pickens in the groove, that's time to take it around. Okay, or Barney Fife in the groove, I guess. Um, so... Now, the last category that I want to talk about is maintenance malpractice. So maintenance malpractice, we've got a couple of good examples that I've done episodes on. And again, I invite you to watch these episodes if you haven't seen them. So I used to fly, when I was the editor of Approach, I used to fly with VF-43, the aggressor squadron, over at Oceana, which was a blast. So I had an opportunity to interview John Glenn, legendary astronaut and senator 
about aviation safety. We did a special theme issue of Approach Magazine and um, Senator Glenn agreed to sit down with us. So I was going to fly from Oceana, which is basically Virginia Beach, to um, Andrews Air Force Base and then take a car from Andrews um, over to um, the Cannon Office Building where Senator Glenn was. I was flying with a guy named Trucker Boyd. Um, Trucker was a puking dog in his uh, first tour, and now he's an aggressor squad lieutenant. So we're going to man up a TA-4, which is this airplane right here, TA-4J. Um, so obviously I'm in the backseat of the TA-4J. Um, the TA-4 had a device called a rifle bolt. So the rifle bolt was a sort of secondary system that kept the canopy in place. Now, so part of the takeoff checklist was rifle bolts, home, lights out. And another sort of uh, safety measure uh, was when you went to military power in the, in the TA-4 or on the A-4, if you didn't have the rifle bolt in place, you'd get this oral tone, a deedle deedle that would tell you it was, it was not in place. And so classic student thing, they would, because they're so high warble about flying, you know, the jet that they might not hear the deedle deedle. And when they would, get to the rendezvous, about 240 knots, the canopy would come off like every time. Okay, so we get to the hold short, cleared to take off, go through takeoff checks, you know, rifle bullet is in place, military power, no deal, deal, Mooch ready to go, I'm ready, boom, we launch. We take off. At about 240 knots, and I'm, I key the radio, like departure, ambush, 43, airborne, passing 200 feet for flight level 230. I didn't hear anything. Departure, ambush, 41, passing 250. And, and then suddenly, I just remember this. In my mind's eye, I can see it as plain as day. I just remember thinking, there is light under the canopy. So it felt like the canopy came unhinged and just hovered there for a second. And then came off. My kneeboard was just ripped off my leg. I was buffeted by 240 knots of breeze. Trucker's first thought was that I had ejected. And so I hunkered down in front of the instrument panel and said, I'm still here. So he knew I hadn't ejected. He, because he had his glare shield, wasn't getting as blown wind buffeted as, as I was. So he slows the airplane down. Because we were heavy, we had to fly out over the water and dump gas for a few minutes. It was cold. I want to think, I want to remember this is like February time frame. It was definitely cold. And then we come back around and we, we land. This is what the airplane looked like. That's actually one of the maintenance guys in the, in the back seat. So this is where the canopy landed next to a house on Virginia Beach Boulevard, just beyond the departure end of runway five. Is that, was that the runway? Yeah, runway five at Oceana. So fortunately didn't hit any house, didn't hit any people. By the time the maintenance crew, and remember we, as soon as we, it happens, we, we call base, we're like, we just lost our canopy. So the maintainers jump in the pickup and they drive it's probably three miles to where this was from the, the flight line. By the time they got there, the wavy TV 10 truck, the local NBC affiliate was already there and filming it. So that's not the kind of publicity you want. So why did this happen? What happened? Oh, and here's me and trucker at Tailhook, And a couple of years ago, we were reunited, but so why, why did this happen? Well, as I said, we went through the takeoff procedures properly. The rifle bolt was in place, but because the maintenance on that airplane wasn't done properly, it behaved as if it wasn't in place. So it runs across, you know, these wires run across, across these, these pulleys, and it was misrouted across one of them. And so that logic, again, you put the light out, but it acts like that rifle bolt isn't in place. So maintenance malpractice. 
And unfortunately, the maintainers that didn't do their jobs went to NJP. And in some cases, they were docked pay and, and uh, you know, reduced in rank and, and, you know, not good things. Aviators trust maintainers categorically. That's why I learned to love the guys who kept me airborne. They taught me about the airplane. But they're subject to the same fifth month of deployment syndrome as we can be in the airplane from time to time. Let me talk about one more example here of maintenance malpractice. Another episode I did called My Pilot Can't See. This is when Reb Edwards and Grundy Grunmeyer were flying an F-14B off of the Dwight D. Eisenhower. That's an F-14A. Um, but they were in VF-142. I was in VF-143. We had just come out of port. Only six planes were airborne during this event, all doing what we call post-maintenance check flights. I was in a VF-143 airplane, F-14B, with Spaz Geyer, and the, we were doing a PMCF Alpha. And, and so... We're, we're Reb and Grundy for our sister squadron. So a PMCF Alpha requires that you do a supersonic dash to make sure that the engines are working fully. So Spaz and I go through ours. Airplane's working great. We're hanging out overhead. And when we check in with Tower, the first thing we hear is the Airboss asking this Ghost Rider airplane, can your pilot see? And Spaz and I are like, what the heck is going on? And Grundy comes up and he says, sort of. And, and so we watch this unfold from low holding. And so Reb is flying this kind of box pattern, trying to assess how he can safely bring the airplane aboard. So what happened is during their supersonic dash, the radar dome came unhinged and smashed into the front canopy. So his canopy glass, his plexiglass was shattered. He got a bunch of it in his eye. Grundy's canopy, the Rio canopy remained intact. So Grundy could communicate. Reb basically couldn't. And so they had to communicate with hand signals in, in different ways to try to figure it out. So Reb wound up bringing the airplane aboard, only looking through the left quarter panel of his front windscreen with his vision damaged, and he managed to save the airplane. This is what the airplane looked like on rollout. So you can see the radome's gone. That's the basic bracket for the AUG-9 radar. You can see here in this picture, his that quarter panel right there is what he was looking through. And his, where it says Lieutenant J.S. Snyder, his glass is missing. The rear canopy is still there. Sorry, my dog's <laughs> wanting something here. Um, so what happened is during the maintenance for this airplane. So the thing that keeps the ray dome in place is this, this handle. So the handle comes out, twists, and these feet translate out. One goes into the radar dome, the other goes into the fuselage. So as they were trying to, and then you, you twist this about 90 degrees and then push that handle flush with the ray dome and it, it should be fine. Right? So they couldn't twist the handle so maintenance malpractice they hammered it so it would twist and then went flush so at that point they were like okay good to go but unfortunately when they hammered it they broke it so the feet did not translate just stayed in place so yes the handle translated and was flush but it hadn't done its job so that's why the radome came off both grundy and reb got air medals for their saving the airplane and their airmanship. Reb went on to be an astronaut. 
And again, uh, he was actually my first virtual guest when I started the channel. So if you haven't seen that episode, uh, check it out. That's another example of maintenance malpractice. So all of these are preventable. And if you follow procedures, brief the flight, fly the brief, do the checklist. A lot of times the QA process in the, on the maintenance side was either not done or short circuited. And so the QA team would also be found at fault when the mishap investigation took place. So our business is rewarding, challenging, and demands full attention at all times. So these are the remarks that I put out to the Connecticut Air National Guard. And I hope that I imparted some things that, that they'll be able to use as they now return to the air in their Blackhawks and Chinooks doing their important part of defending the nation. So that was the brief. And now let me look at some of your questions and see if we can't address some of that. Yeah, Walter says, hammers and airplanes don't mix. Well, if you use them right, they do, right? Um, the problem was they, they used it in a way that was uh, not intended. Gun decking, yes, that's a word I haven't heard for a while. Tommy, you're correct. Gun decking is the fleet term for skipping a step. So yes, the pressure's on. No doubt, this is not an easy job. Skippers are like, I want to. I don't want to miss a sortie, Master Chief, right? And so Master Chiefs have to be resourceful. They have to do this triage all the time in a way that that uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we cut corners, but we never want to hazard an air crew or an airplane or the other guys on the flight deck, you know? And so that's the the, the fine line that sometimes... Uh, we had to travel to get airplanes uh, airborne. And in this case, this is a no-brainer. If you have to hammer the handle to get it to go 90 degrees, then, in fact, those guys could have lifted up the ray dome with, with, their, with them, themselves before the airplane got airborne and figured out that this was probably not, not an airplane that was safe to go flying. Um, what else we got here? Feed that poor dog. Yeah, she wants to go outside. Um, so I should probably get going with that. All right. So great crowd. Thank you for your comments yesterday that that suggested that that we do this. Um, let me also point out that they the guys gave me this very cool Minuteman statue. It's uh now has a place of honor on in the uh the Moochland facility here. Uh, so I, I thank you very much to uh, to my hosts. Also, I thank the New Jersey Air National Guard for flying me up there in a C-12 and the North Carolina National Guard for flying me back in a, a C-26, as documented in that that uh, ungrounded episode I, I did yesterday. So if you haven't seen that one, check it out. Um, as always, subscribe. Um, appreciate your support in a whole bunch of ways. Super Chat by showing up to these things and participating if you'd like to help support, do the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron. I love my patrons. We do happy hours every Friday on Zoom. Also, they had to first look at tickets for Moochapalooza. Tickets still available, so I would love to meet you guys in person in Annapolis on July 15th. Check out the details in the episode description. We're going to rock. We're going to have a blast. I would love to see folks in real life, supporters of the channel. My patrons have become my friends as a function of things like uh, Mucha Palooza. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you guys again very soon.